Hey folks, Malforan here, and today we're going to be covering the second half of the first dev diary for the Roads to Power DLC that is coming for Crusader Kings 3. In the first half, they covered the initial news on the admin government type. That gave us our foundational knowledge, really, of the basics. Well, I'm not going to say basics, because that video was like an hour long, but kind of like how that works in general, all the like new mechanics and things like that. And then in the second half of that dev diary, they wanted to cover the estate system, and that is what this video is going to be about. It's going to be a little bit shorter than the previous video, but I wanted to do it as a standalone one, just in case you only wanted to know about estates and not to make that previous video crazy long. So do make sure to hit like if you enjoy this, subscribe to the channel. I cover a lot of Crusader Kings, dev diaries, news, discussion videos, all that kind of stuff. And I'm also covering EU5 on the channel, which has been unofficially announced on the Paradox forums for a while now, and they're doing dev diaries each week as well. But anyway, let's get on to estates. And as they're showing here, this is an estate in Constantinople, in all its glory being the capital of the Byzantines. And it took them a while to settle on this art style. I like the fact that they did. I really like this art style. I kind of wish they went back into other systems and implemented this as well. But I really like how it looks, especially as you upgrade the buildings of things. I think it looks really, really cool. And as they said, they based this on medieval manuscripts. And you could definitely see that from how it looks here. And then on top of that, they do actually call out here that the buildings will look differently as you upgrade them and construct them. And that also the land that you see on the actual art itself does change depending on the local terrain where your estate is located. I think we did see this in a previous one the other week where it did look slightly different, but this does confirm that this is kind of dynamic depending on where your estate is. So this one, obviously a little bit, not really farmland, but just general plains land with the city around it. I imagine if you've got an estate up in the hills, it's going to be very hilly, less of the buildings around the outskirts and things like that. So that's awesome. They could have just had a general picture that everyone had, but it is actually changing. I love the fact that they've done that, and I'm sure they'll be able to add things later on as well to this, which is really, really cool. But the actual system itself, in an admin realm, it is the families of the nobles that really matter, as they discussed in the first half of this dev diary. Each househead will have its own estate, which is a representation of the family's overall wealth and any small tracts of land that they own. While a noble family might not hold a governorship, they are still influential nobles that hold a significant amount of real estate. The purpose of the estates is twofold. It gives you a power base to rely on at all times, acting as your home and the place where your character resides when you don't have any other titles. If you haven't watched that first video, you can be active in this system without actually owning any land directly. So you can be a governor in the Byzantines, for example, and not actually own any of the land you are governing over. So... That is one thing that they've called out again here. You don't necessarily have to own land to have one of these estates. So do keep that in mind. Secondly, it exists as a means of progression, one that you can tailor to suit your own needs and play styles. Estates grant you access to a whole bunch of buildings and upgrades, providing you with various bonuses, unlocking new interactions or decisions, and improving your existing toolbox in various ways. It is also, without a doubt, one of the primary resources to increasing your influence. And again, if you don't know what influence is, the previous video did cover that and gave us some examples of where you could gain it and spend it. I would say I'm like moderately worried about stat stacking again. This comes up about every 12 months after we've had expansions and things, but like a lot of the things we've seen already in an admin realm give you bonuses in different areas. So you're going to have, you know, the governorships, you're going to have places in the council, different things such as house bonuses and things like that. And then you're also going to have the estate and this is kind of stacked on top of most of the other systems in the game as well. I'm slightly worried that some of these numbers are going to get pretty insane and you're going to be able to focus way too much into certain areas of gameplay to just make yourself so overpowered. It's going to be a little bit crazy, but we'll see. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. But in the back of my mind, I am slightly worried about the number of places you could pick up stats for certain things. I know why they do it to make it more interesting. But I don't know, there's so many ways you could pick up little bits of bonuses for different systems, which I think once added together actually stack up pretty bad. But we will see, obviously, and they did call out at the beginning of this dev diary that all the numbers you see here are still work in progress and don't take too much in the numbers that you see already. They are probably what they'll be, but they did say they've got some more balanced passes to do, so don't be worried about it too much. But again, as I said, we'll see once we get our hands on it. Estates can become quite powerful on their own, so they are restricted to one per family. I mean, that does make sense, to be honest. Owned and controlled by the house head. It is only the house head who can construct new buildings and upgrade existing ones, similar to how only the dynasty head can pick and unlock dynasty legacies. I think that makes sense anyway, thematically. If you're the house head and you run the estate, it makes sense that only you build buildings there. I think that would make sense to most people. 
One of the primary goals is to provide you with plenty of options as to what you want to build, but building should also have a certain degree of synergy with each other. As you consider your options and what to build, they want you to be on the lookout to how certain buildings and upgrades complement each other. So I'm sure there are different ways these kind of interact. I'm sure we saw in a previous one, they were more military focused. This one here is a large warehouse, a garden, some other buildings. So it looks like you can focus them towards certain areas of the game. And that is what you're going to want to like synergize together. Very similar to how buildings work elsewhere, but it looks like especially the case here where you want to have your estate focused on one area of the game maybe, and you're going to get the most out of it if you do that rather than just building random buildings that you think look cool. And then talking about buildings, there are two distinct types of improvements you can build within your estate. The first is buildings. You have one building slot that is dedicated to your villa or mansion, which is a bit special as you will always start with a building on at least level one and you can never demolish it. So the main building makes sense. You can never demolish that. That is the heart of your estate. I mean, why would you even want to? But I guess it's cool that it calls it out, I suppose. Aside from your mansion, you will have six slots in total. You construct whichever buildings available to you that you want. Two of the slots are available from the get-go, and then you will unlock additional ones with every level of your mansion. You'll get two slots to level one, three slots to level two, and so on until you reach the maximum at level five. There are plenty more buildings than you have slots, so you'll be forced to choose what you want to build. As they were getting at earlier, you want to plan ahead a little bit and kind of synergize the ones that you want to pick up. Buildings can be easily replaced whenever you want, though, so you won't be stuck with anything if you ever change your mind. It won't cost you anything to replace the building other than the gold it costs to construct the replacement building. So, yeah, you're not kind of stuck in. I guess if you're playing at the beginning as a more stewardship character, you might build some stewardship-related buildings. And then if you find yourself playing a lot more martial later on, might be able to change them into more martial focus buildings i think they're going to be expensive enough that not every character you play you're going to want to be changing them in and out your choices won't end there however some buildings but not all have multiple branches where you can choose to specialize your buildings further branches often share the same effects from the base level before it splits into separate branches but will then go on to provide slightly different bonuses around a similar theme and as you can see in the next screenshot this is the monastery once you get up to level four you can actually split it into these three different trees. As you can see in the screenshot, they're going down the bottom tier of the three options by the looks of it. This will unlock the commission icon decision, give you tax, piety, and monthly piety. Now, I would imagine all three of them give you tax and piety. That is what monasteries kind of did historically. It was all about gaining money and also, you know, furthering the good of God, if you want to believe them. But I imagine it's the top one, the unlocking the decision. That's the main change. The two above maybe either give you a different decision or give you a different bonus based on which one you choose. In the second screenshot, you can see the large warehouse. Again, this has two options which split out after level two. And then the path they've chosen here is the top one. And this will give you an interaction unlock with the house head. It will give you additional tax, additional supply capacity for your armies and building construction costs minus 15%. So again, with the other systems in the game, you could stack building construction cost reduction considerably high i think already with the different bonuses if you're a stewardship focused character you're going to be able to get building construction cost modifiers i'm not going to say up to like a hundred percent reduction but i could see how you could easily get up to like 50 60 70 percent potentially so again how they balance this is going to be interesting to see but it looks like that's the top run the bottom one we don't know what it gives but as they said it gives a slightly different set of bonuses by the looks of it i'm sure the tax and the supply limit probably the same Maybe the construction cost and the interaction unlock are different on the other track. We'll see, obviously, in the future. And then the second type of improvement you can do is upgrades. This is slightly different to the upgrade system in the normal game, I guess, for buildings. This is where you can upgrade your mansion with specific additional kind of buildings inside that building. So kind of like expanding your mansion with additional small upgrades, if you want to think about it that way. And the mansion has a limited number of upgrade slots available. You'll have two from the get-go, and then as you upgrade your mansion, you'll get more and more of these. Upgrades can also have the branching building paths, but most won't. I guess that's going to be for the most important changes. They don't want this kind of bloating out all the different upgrades and buildings and everything. I think that would get a little bit out of hand after a while. They also tend to have fewer levels in total compared to buildings. Buildings typically have six levels and may have less in some cases, whilst upgrades tend to be closer to four levels. All of this variation should give you plenty of options throughout the many hundreds of years that the game spans and that we all obviously play. We all play to the end of the game. We all know that. So this does look like it's kind of stacked on top of the mansion to kind of just upgrade the mansion. And then you have all the other buildings as well around it. So that's cool to see. You can specialize it even further than just your estate, even just the main mansion building. Again, does it go overpowered with stat stacking? We shall see in the future. So here's some examples of the buildings you can attach to your mansion or manor, depending on how big your estate is. So the first one here is a library. This obviously increases your learning lifestyle experience. 
This particular upgrade has two distinct branches available. One that ties into education, improving your tutor court position and allowing your children to get rank five education. So another way to get rank five education outside of the way that it was added previously. I think it's through universities only at the moment. Having a library allows you to get that as well now. So that's kind of cool to see it being expanded into other areas of the game. So you don't have to only get it from universities. You can have this kind of like mana library that would teach them. And as you can see here, they've gone down the bottom track here. And this is the one that unlocks the rank five education traits. It gives physician aptitude plus 10, tutor salary cost minus 50%, the tutor aptitude plus 20, and learning lifestyle experience plus 20%. The one above, I imagine that doesn't give you the education trait bonuses, but gives you other learning focus bonuses instead. So again, pretty cool. You can specialize this. And then I guess if you're not playing a lot of learning characters or you've done what you wanted to do with your learning characters, you can then switch this into something else as well. Even just remove this building and replace it with something else. The mansion can also be upgraded with a wine room, which turns into a wine cellar later on. This unlocks a new activity option for Feast, which is really cool, actually, to see them kind of linking into these other systems. I said that about the last DLC as well. It's good to see them kind of loop these in into other systems. Again, because they know everyone has these systems with how DLC works, with the main features being in the free patches, they know they can hook this into systems and that everyone's going to have them. Like, obviously, everyone has Feast, but... I think you know what I mean. This will allow you to spend some gold to gain influence from every guest attending your feast, so a really good way to get influence. Each level unlocks a corresponding level of the activity, allowing you to spend more gold for a larger amount of influence gained. Feasts are no longer just a means to gain prestige and opinion, but becomes a much more central tool in your attempts to gain more and more influence. Again, I really like that. I like that they've looked at something like feasts and thought, okay, that could be a great way to bring influence in. Let's build this building that you don't have to build. And then that kind of like hooks into that system. And then you can build your influence through that. That's actually a really cool way that they've done it. I really, really like that. I like how they're hooking it into other systems that you will usually take part in, but kind of this additional level of content on top of it. And then obviously with a wine cellar, what do you need? Well, you need a vineyard and I'm sure these synergize together quite well. This building provides you a steady income of gold, which is quite useful already. But the true value also comes from having the wine room mentioned above as it increases the amount of influence you gain when you use the unlocked activity option for feast. That's actually really awesome. I like how this does synergize. As they said earlier, you will want to decide which buildings you want. I like that this kind of buffs the other building in a way that makes sense. You know, you've got this wine cellar. You're no longer importing wines into your mansion. You are now making the wines yourself. And that means you get more influence because I guess the people who are attending the feast are like, wow, this is his own wine. That's awesome. And that's going to affect the influence you can get. And as you can see, at level six, which is maxed out, you also get 1.2 gold a month as well, which is a nice bonus. I mean, it costs you a lot of gold to build. So it's one of those things where it's going to take you a long time to earn the gold back. But the influence is probably worth way more than the 600 gold, especially at this point in the game. This is probably quite laid on and you've probably got a bit of money built up as well at that point. And then with that, that is the initial look at the estate system. As I said, a lot shorter than the video earlier today that covered the admin side of things. And this is just our initial look. I'm sure we'll get some more information about this in the future as well, but I really like how this looks. This is, again, more than I thought they'd do with this. I thought it would just be simple buildings, and they just gave flat bonuses, which, yes, a lot of them do just give flat bonuses, but I like the synergy there. I like the fact that you can kind of switch the buildings out. I'm not sure if you should be able to switch them out so often, but I guess, you know, historically, if you had an estate, you could do with it whatever you wanted, but... I'm a bit worried about some of these systems, as we saw in the previous video, where you can kind of change the family attribute bonus that you get. I think there's a lot of ways here where, yes, it's going to cost you a lot of money, but you can like hyper specialize in certain areas of the game. I'm not too sure about that path. If that is a road we should be taking, is that a road to too much power, you could almost say. But let me know what you think in the comments down below. I'm sure it'll be fine. As I said, these aren't finalized numbers, but... I don't know. I'm not too sure about all this stat stacking. I know I've mentioned that a lot in these two videos. I'll try not to in the future, but I don't know. It's just in the back of my mind. But as I said, that is the end of the estates bit. I will say there's a little bit here about modding, just saying that you can be able to highly mod this. I'm sure there's going to be some mods that go really crazy with this system. I wonder if you'll be able to use this to make like palaces for kings and emperors. I'm sure that's going to come into the actual Crusader Kings game in the future. But I wonder if a mod could do that to build like a palace system out of this where you could have similar bonuses and make the UI look like a castle that gradually got bigger and bigger. Think of like, what was it, like Civ 2 or Civ 3 where you could build your own palace? Maybe it was the initial civilization. I can't remember now. And you kind of just built this palace. It didn't really do anything. It just looked cooler as you progress through the game. 
it would be awesome if somebody built that mod. I'm sure someone will if you can do, but I did want to call that out. It is highly moddable. You can do a bunch of things with it. I don't make mods myself. As I always say, I play amazing mods. I have no idea how they work. So if you are a modder, it looks like you can have some fun with this. And uh, yeah, that's the end of the dev diary. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. A lot of interesting information here. We have got like three months to launch, so I can't imagine these dev diaries are going to be this big all the way up to launch. But let me know what you think about everything we've seen. And do you like that I split it up into two videos, I suppose, as well? I thought a combined video would be way too long, so hopefully you like this format where I've split it out a little bit. And then as they said earlier, next week we're going to get part two of the Admin Realms, and that is going to be about how governorships work, the day-to-day -day gameplay of that, how they manage troops, and then also how succession works for governors as well. I'm not sure if we're going to get a bonus thing attached to that, kind of like how we got the estate system here, but that is what they're going to be talking about next week. So as always, hit that like button, subscribe if you're new here, and we'll be able to cover that next week and have a discussion about it. But we'll leave it there for today, and I'll see you in the next one.